One, two. Hello, Hosanna. It's so good to see you again. My goodness, has life changed very dramatically and very quickly, hasn't it? And nothing, not even the news media, has chronicled change better than the creators of Facebook memes. If you're on Facebook, maybe you've seen some of these. I love how so many people are trying to keep a sense of humor in all of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've seen some fascinating examples in recent weeks. I think my favorite was this one. The dumbest thing I've ever done was purchased a 2020 planner. <laughs> oh, seriously, all of our planners are out the windows. Or how about this one? Introverts of the world rejoice uh, when the coronavirus really spreads through human interaction. <laughs> this has been a lovely time for some of us introverts. It is now acceptable to wear masks to the bank <laughs> to make a withdrawal. You never would have imagined that, would you? Or that washing your hands <laughs> so many times could be dangerous to your health. <laughs> Even our pets are having trouble dealing with us being around quite so much. Uh, I like this one for those of you that are friends of Big Bang Theory. All of a sudden, everybody has become Sheldon, <laughs> who is always a bit of a nervous sort as a character. And my second favorite one, and given the toilet paper shortage that those CBS receipts <laughs> are finally paying off if you need to be creative. Now, those are funny, and we know that a lot that's going on isn't funny at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the reasons we need to laugh because uh, of all the other stuff. There's all the people who've gotten sick or, or, or who've died as a result of this virus. And many people have lost jobs temporarily or even permanently. Mm -hmm. Businesses have closed. Residents of nursing homes, hospitals, and retirement centers have been cut off from their families, at least from visits. Children are going stir crazy, and their parents, my goodness, their parents are in many cases worn out. This was a funny one. Here's Sue, 31 years old, homeschooling her kids for the past five days. Great job, Sue. <laughs> and it's funny, but my goodness, I feel in strong compassion for parents of young children these days. There's other things. Weddings have been canceled, funerals postponed, all sorts of other life celebrations are happening in other maybe less joyful ways. Mm -hmm. What did Easter dinner look like for you last weekend? The Blairs, we shared dinner on Zoom with our extended family. Everybody's sitting in their own table and uh, looking at the screen together. Well, here's one more meme I saw just the other day that I think summarized well what many people are thinking right now. When this is all over, there are three words I don't ever want to hear again. Uncertain, unprecedented, and difficult. Well, things are different. And we're hoping they don't stay this way. Not very much longer. But what should they become? There's a lot of talk right now about things returning to normal. But we don't really want that, do we? Normal is far too often silly or shallow violent or dangerous, dysfunctional or even disastrous. This is an opportunity for the world to change for the better, isn't it? Mm. And for those of us who have been changed by Christ to point that way forward. But for that to happen, our lives will have to include a fair amount of uncertainty. The changes will be unprecedented and the process will indeed sometimes be difficult, whether we want to hear those words or not. Yeah. But there is good news here. Do not be afraid. Because what will happen in this process will also be good. Yeah. It's what our hearts have been waiting for. It's what our world has been longing for. It's what we all desperately need. Yes, and thanks, Tony. And last week, we saw that Jesus' resurrection changed everything. Um, it changed everything, starting with Jesus himself. And because Jesus was changed, the experience of the Trinity was changed. Because God had never been human before. And in the incarnation, that happened. For 33 years through Jesus, God experienced firsthand everything that we experience. And that was definitely a big change for God. Mm -hmm. um, um, and the thing is, though, that Jesus' resurrection made that change permanent. Divinity and humanity, the invisible and the visible, were joined together eternally in the resurrected Jesus. And yes, that did change everything. So last time, last week, we focused on God's Easter celebration, sharing in Jesus' own joy at being alive again, and also sharing in the Father's joy of having his son alive again. 
Well, today we're going to talk about how that celebration um, overflowed from the Father, the Son, and the Spirit to include Jesus' friends and followers, those who were with him then and all who would later choose to follow um, through all the centuries, including you and me. As we enter into the celebration of resurrection, we, we not only get to share God's joy, we also get to share in Jesus' resurrection. We not only get to receive God's love, we are transformed by that love into the people that God created us to be. Mm -hmm. People who are truly the likeness and image of Christ in the world. The scriptures declare just how radically Jesus' resurrection changes us. 1 John 4.17 says this, As he is, so are we in this world. As Jesus is, that's present tense, that means now, ongoing action in the present moment. As Jesus is now, and how is Jesus now? Jesus is alive from the dead now. And in him, so are we now in this world, not only waiting for resurrection so we can go to heaven one day, we're alive in him now in this world. Jesus is resurrected now, and so are we, no matter what we might think or feel to the contrary. Jesus' resurrection changes everything, including us. And in a way, this change shouldn't surprise us because we were created for change. At the beginning of the story in Genesis, we see that Change was woven into the fabric of God's creation. Seasons changed. Plants grew and bore fruit in regular rhythms. And humanity was told to multiply and fill the earth. So that meant babies would be born who would grow into adults, and who would have babies of their own, who would grow into adults, who would have babies of their own. See, God did not create a static, unchanging universe. Living things grow, and growth requires change. And yes, also at the beginning of the story, we made a choice. We made a choice that changed our relationship to God in some very damaging ways. Yet God provided a way for us. He provided a way for that destructive change to be changed. See, the resurrection made the greatest change of all possible for us. Eternal relationship with God. See, and this is all so very exciting. But if this is true, and it is, then why aren't all of us living the shared resurrection life with Jesus right now in this world? Well, that's what we want to unpack a bit this morning. And then we'll want to come back to it again in even more practical de detail in the coming weeks. So this week is going to be very foundational, but it's core. It's core to who we are as Christians. It's core to who we are as, as Hosanna. It's core to who we get to be in a moment like this, when the world seems to be wondering which way is forward. Yes. We have hope. We have a message. So to understand why we do not always live in this shared resurrection life right now, the question that Joanne asked us, let's start with what God did when he raised Jesus from the dead. It's more than we may think at first. And then let's ask a follow-up question. How does Jesus' transformation outwork in our own lives? Mm -hmm. Now, the first answer here is that we're going to notice that Jesus was resurrected in a real physical body. After he was raised from the dead, he spoke. He ate. He walked. He had wounds. His body was functioning like we think a normal human body does, but it had also changed somehow. Yeah. Think about it. He wasn't immediately recognizable to his friends. He could materialize in a, cloud, in a closed room. Right. On his last day, he defied gravity and ascended up into the clouds. Well, you know, what was that, a Star Trek transporter? <laughs> Beam me up, Father. Um, or, or, or I, you... Tony, I actually used to know someone when I was a brand new Christian who believed that it was an alien spaceship that took Jesus up and it was just hidden by clouds. Oh, well, that's, that's first <laughs> contact with the Vulcans, I guess. Yes. <laughs> Or what if it was that his body was transformed in front of his friends? 
so they could just get a glimpse of the transformation awaiting them and awaiting us. And that transformation is present even in our own bodies. We're not just spiritual beings. Because Jesus' resurrection changed his body, our experience of our own bodies can change. Now, some Christians will struggle with this. You're Hosanna, and you're, you're, you're typically wiser and deeper than that. You got, you'll get this. But over the centuries, many people of faith have attempted to downplay the body in favor of the spirit. There was even a group in the early centuries of the church, um, the, the docetists, they were called. They insisted that human bodies are disgusting, and they're sinful, and they're corrupt. So Jesus would never have come in one of those. Jesus' body must have been merely an illusion. It just seemed to have one. Mm -hmm. But that's not biblical, and that's not orthodox theology. It was recognized even then for that. Those, the first human beings, Adam and Eve, were created as physical beings. Adam out of the dust of the earth, Eve out of Adam, and God looked at them, and you know what he said? At those bodies, at the way they created, you are very good. And Jesus was born into one of those bodies, too. And God became flesh and blood, fully human. That's part of our, our, our belief, part of the core doctrine of the church. Yes. Our bodies must not at all be distasteful to God, as they are to so many of us. Yeah. But, yes, our bodies also illustrate what life in this broken world does to us. Hard labor, childbirth, sickness, violence, stress, abuse, addiction, accidents, injuries, all this stuff, and much more cause pain and distress. And so our bodies get break down, and our bodies die. And today, we, here we are in the midst of a global pandemic that thankfully is not claiming nearly as many lives as originally predicted, but, but tens of thousands nonetheless. Yeah. It can be very scary. Yeah. And that's why it's really good news that when Jesus rose from the dead, he rose with a physical body, even a glorified one. What do we mean by that? Mm -hmm. Paul had told the Corinthians a wonderful truth. He said, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. That person is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Does that include our bodies as well? Paul said, yes, absolutely. Now, the Corinthians were skeptical about this, almost like many other people have been. And, and he, he addresses them in another letter. He says, I can, I can almost hear someone saying, how can the dead come back to life? And what kind of body will they have when they are resurrected? Well, why we got Jesus, right? He answered their question by describing what happens when a seed is sown in the ground. It sort of dies. It goes into the dark. It's buried. But it comes back to life later as a plant looking very different than it did when you put it in the ground. Something is transformed. It's still the same thing. It's still the same essence, but it becomes something very different. Same is true of a caterpillar when it goes through the process of metamorphosis. And the same thing he says is true of us. The body and he's referring here, our physical human body is sown, like that seed, in decay, but it will be raised in immortality. Yes. It is sown in humiliation, but it will be raised in glorification. It is sown in weakness, but it will be raised in power. Yes. And wow, that gives us hope, doesn't it? Especially when we might feel like our own bodies are weak or decaying, when we're vulnerable. Mm-hmm that immortality and glorification and power await these puny bodies of ours. And it's not just for the future. It's also an encouragement to love our bodies here and now, mm -hmm. as hard as that may be sometimes to do, as it seems that we're going to remain embodied for eternity. Yep. yep. God seems to love bodies. He's made an awful lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> and this all means also that because Jesus' resurrection changed the death of our bodies, our experience of death can change as well. Yep. God sees the death of our bodies differently than most people do. Always has. Yep. God knows what our bodies were originally intended for. It was to make, and he knew what death was originally intended to do, to make things new. He built death and rebirth into everything he made. The seasons of, of life, the earth itself, and, but in Christ, death is transformed back into that original purpose. And not just his death. See, that's often where people start to stop the Easter service. Yay, hallelujah, Jesus is alive. But as our death gets transformed as well, Scripture says it. One has died for all. Therefore, all have died. We died with him. When we were in Christ, we die, we die with him. Why? So we may live and live with the purpose. Yeah. 
And that's why he continues with that. And he died for all so that those who live may no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. We have a better reason, a better purpose for our life. We are raised to something new and different. We're like that seed that is sprouted into a plant that is now has a life for a reason. Our lives become new in him. Yes. And this means that this means that death no longer is our enemy, but our friend. Yep. It's no longer just the end of something. I mean, that's, it comes at the end of an obituary, right? <laughs> it's the end of the story, and that's the way we've been taught to think of it. But it's also the beginning of something. Yes. And it's the beginning, in this case, our, our spiritual life, beginning of life for a reason. And eternity itself begins now for those who are in Christ. Yes. On earth as it is in heaven. We have to wait till we die in order to experience eternal life. Because that's something we get to participate in now. The kingdom of God has come to us. Eternal life has come to us. Abundant life has come to us. Mm -hmm. Changes everything about death. And someday even dying, which for many is the hardest part of all of this, that's going to be abolished too. Yeah. So as Paul told the Corinthians elsewhere, death has truly, forever, permanently lost its sting. Oh, yes, it has. And what was death's sting? Paul tells us that too. He says the sting of death is sin. Okay, we're going to stop in the verse. There's more in the verse to read, but the, the sting of death is sin. Stop for a moment, and we want to notice the word sin is singular. Not sins, plural, but sin. That's because there's a difference between sin and sins, and that difference really matters. Mm -hmm. Sin, singular, refers to our inner state of being. It refers to our core nature, or our core identity, when we're separated from God. Sin, if, if you think of it, Tam Tony was talking about seeds earlier, and Paul was talking about seeds. If you think about sin is like, the root and trunk of a tree that's growing within us. And sins, plural, are the outward branches and the fruit of that tree. So, apart from God in Christ, we are like a, a tree whose roots are sin. Separation. Intern that's our internal identity, interior that tree grows up and the hidden sin state can be seen by the sins that are committed, the fruit of that sin tree. Um, our words, our actions reveal the source that they come from. That's like Jesus said, you'll know a tree and you'll know a person by its fruit. fruit. We'll know the state of someone's beings by observing the fruit that they bear in their life. So the verse goes on. The sting, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And how does that victory come? Of course, you know the answer is through resurrection because resurrection changes everything. So we can indeed rejoice because Jesus' resurrection changed sin. So our experience of sin can change. How did Jesus' resurrection change sin? Well, as Tony said earlier, um, by initiating a new creation. The verse, um, Paul, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. And that everything, it includes you and me. Yes. See, the first Christians understood exactly what Paul meant. The old life, the old covenant. Our old sin-enslaved selves died. We were crucified with Christ, Paul says. He was, we were crucified with Christ. We died and were buried with Christ. And when he rose, so did we. And we receive this changed, resurrected life when we come to Christ in faith. It's, it's kind of, it's an exchange. Paul explained it this way. 
He said, your old sin-loving nature was buried with him by baptism when he died. Baptism, all that is, it's an outward physical symbol of this inner spiritual change, transformation. Your old sin-loving nature was buried with him by baptism when he died. And when God the Father with glorious power brought him back to life again, you were given his wonderful new life to enjoy. So this, if this is true, the question remains, why are we, um, and most Christians, living anything but resurrected lives? Yes. Right. One reason, there's probably others, but one crucial reason is that we have not been taught just how radical our transformation in Christ really is. We have not been taught just how changed we truly are. See, what most Christians are, are taught is that even after we give our lives to Christ, we remain sinners. The tree is still there, and we're still bearing sin's fruit in our lives. The problem with that is nowhere in the New Testament is a Christian ever called a sinner. Nowhere. We are called saints. We are holy ones. That's what saint means. We're holy ones. Because when Christ comes to live his resurrected life in us, that old tree of sin is torn up by its roots. And his tree of life is planted within us. And that tree of life will bear the fruit of the spirit as we nurture its growth over time in love. See, it, it is so radical. I, you know, you can even understand why over time, Christians, the church, they looked around and they said, wait a minute, we don't seem to be changed. And they got into this very sin conscious understanding. They got this idea that somehow that we have two natures <laughs> living side by side. That is not biblical. Our very nature is changed through the resurrection of Jesus Christ by faith when he comes to dwell within us. Our identity is remade. It is completely new. We are new creations in Christ, period. In Christ, we're set free from the power of sin and death. In Christ, we're no longer sin's slaves. We are joined as one with Christ, who is now living his life through us in the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, there is a sin has no power over us anymore. That is not our nature. Our nature is renewed. It is changed. It is recreated. We are freed. We are no longer slaves to sin. He says, we, what we get to be are slaves to righteousness, slaves to God's goodness and God's love. Listen again to Paul's radical proclamation in the passage that um, Tony was reading from earlier in 2 Corinthians 5. Paul says, for our sake, God made Jesus to be sin, singular, right? For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. And the word might be, words might become literally is saying so that we can be becoming. Oh my gosh, he became sin for us so that we might become his righteousness. Holy cow, that's what's real. Jesus has forever changed our experience with sin. Jesus became our sin and destroyed its power so that in him we can become his righteousness. As Christ is, so are we now in this world. We can begin to live our resurrected lives now, like Tony said earlier, even as we're waiting for the final transformation of our bodies. See, the, the resurrection chain, it's already begun. Now, this doesn't mean that we will not occasionally commit sins. Of course, we can still choose to sin. The thing is, we don't have to. We're not slaves to sin anymore. We don't have to sin. And actually, why would we want to? It's not even our core desire anymore. Right, it isn't even what we want to do anymore. Romans 7, 
the thing I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, the, what, that is not talking about two natures. That's talking about the struggle within. As we finally come to the realization of what we truly want and what we were created by God to be. Maybe an illustration. Um, all illustrations break down, but you know, it's like moving into a completely renovated house that's still in the same old neighborhood. Our core identity has been completely changed, but we can still be tempted by the old patterns of life in the old neighborhood. But those temptations, listen, they over time also lose their power as we continue to nurture that new life, that tree of life planted within us. How do we nurture that new life? By cooperating with God's grace. God does it. We don't. We just go along and cooperate and partner with God. So we cooperate with his grace in the renewing of our minds. So over time, we grow to think more and more like he does. We cooperate with his grace in the renewing of our hearts. So that over time, we grow more and more to feel and desire what he does. And we cooperate with his grace in renewing our wills so that we grow more and more free to choose life rather than death in every moment. That's the choice. The real choice for those of us who are in Christ and living a resurrected life is not really about right and wrong because we don't want to do wrong anymore. The real choice is choose life, not death. And then we get to, over time and into eternity, enjoy the victory we already have in Christ over both death and sin. Amen and hallelujah. Amen. I guess we could stop right there. <laughs> but there's more. <laughs> but the news gets even better. And I didn't get that slide up there. Fully participate in the life Christ is asking us to leave. Yep. Because... There is even more that God has for us because Jesus' resurrection changed relationship. Yes. Our experience of relationship can also change. And this is direct, this flows directly out of what Joanne was just saying about a relationship with sin being changed because it is sin that has separated us from God and from each other. And this started way back at the beginning, way back in the garden with the first man and the first woman. They chose sin. And when they did, they turned against one another immediately. He did it. Nah, she made me do it. They felt naked and ashamed before God and each other. And as we read the biblical story, we see that over the coming generations, every relationship was soured by sin until sin had separated us all from each other. And most significantly, it separated us from the one who had created us in love and still longed to be with us in love. And that's why Jesus came and died and rose again to bring God and humans together in intimate loving union. He prayed in the night before his crucifixion that we would be one with each other as he was one with the father. And he was raised from the dead so that our sin soaked separation could end and we could be reconciled. Now to be reconciled, to reconcile means to bring back together. And that's why that passage from 2 Corinthians 5 that we keep coming back to says also that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, their sins, yeah. and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. Not only our own, our own not only are our own relationships changed because of Christ, but our mission is as well. We said that we were created a new life for a purpose, right? Well, Paul announced that we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. It's part of every Christian joy to be ambassadors of this good news to the world. How about right now, especially? Boy, doesn't the world need ambassadors of good news? Mm -hmm. To announce and to illustrate in our own lives, not just talking, but to yeah. live it out in our own lives, that what Paul referred to elsewhere as a dividing wall of hostility has been broken down. That wall's been crumbled. He's been breaking chains, breaking barriers, breaking rules. God is creating in his church a new people on the earth. From every tribe and every tongue, every artificial wall, every artificial barrier that has separated us, he tears down and he brings them together in order to not only model out reconciliation, but to offer reconciliation to the whole world. 
so that they too can experience it in its fullness. What an opportunity we have. Always. But what an opportunity we have right now. Yes. To offer that, to model that, to live that out. But no, as Joanna said before, we know that's not the experience of most. Mm -hmm. We still feel our separation from others. And right now, to be honest, we may feel more acutely than most times when we're a little more isolated from each other, except perhaps through a screen. Mm -hmm. And we may be sitting here, you may be sitting here listening to this, feeling a little bit lonely or ignored or misunderstood or weird or irrelevant, mm -hmm. maybe even to God. To be honest, the church has often made this sense of separation worse, not better. Yep. The church, globally, I'm referring to here, has not always been in practice an agent of reconciliation. But there is hope, even for a broken people in a broken church. I was in Corinth a few weeks ago. This is the people that Paul is writing most of this to. It may have been, that was a hard, hard city. It may have been the most difficult place in the ancient world to try to live as one body in Christ. And they struggled with it, as we do. We see the letters that Paul wrote to them and the difficulties that they had. And maybe they encourage us strangely that the Corinthians were a little screwed up and so are we. And maybe there's hope for us. See, because in Christ they were reconciled. Yep. And because of Christ, they carried that message of reconciliation into that broken, needy city and beyond it. Yes. Because it was and is the good news that changes all relationships. And so it is our message and our desire too at Hosanna. That we too may experience relationship differently because of Christ. Yes. To show the world what a difference it makes. And maybe, just maybe this extremely odd time in the history of the world. This odd time in our lives. This, this period when the planner just gets thrown out and everything is different than we thought it would be. Gives us an opportunity to reboot and to live this out even a little more fully. Wow. Resurrection really has changed everything for us. Really has. One more, because the good news only continues. And it continues especially as we live through this time um, that Tony's been describing, this time that we're all living through when our usual reality has been greatly altered. The good news continues because... Jesus' resurrection changed reality itself. So our experience of reality can change. <laughs> so what is reality anyway? And I say, <laughs> hmm, <laughs> that is a huge question. Um, I don't know that we have just one answer for it. I don't think there is one answer, but that's a huge question for both theologians and scientists alike. Um, for the sake of simplicity, let's just say that reality is what can be commonly observed and verified. Um, things that can be perceived and experienced with the senses and somehow validated as true, real. Um, let's also notice though that objective reality can be subjectively interpreted. See, there's the thing itself, that object, that person, that situation. And then there are the different meanings that different people attach to that thing. Because as we all know, we see from where we stand. So everyone is now, for example, everyone is now sharing the experience of the same virus, right? Loose in the world. But there are as many different perceptions and understandings of that experience as there are people in the world. Some people believe that God sent the virus as some kind of wake-up call or punishment. Some believe that climate change may be the culprit. Others believe that things like this just happen because it's the nature of viruses to mutate. Some worry that it was done for evil purposes. There are some who think that this is the most wonderful time of rest and Sabbath. God bless those folks. I know, bless, I do bless them. While others, right, especially those who are not financially secure, especially those, like Tony said earlier, who have young children, they may not be experiencing this, you know, as quite as wonderful a time of rest as a very frightening or frustrating time. 
But as we said earlier, there is one interpretation of reality that seems to be shared by multitudes of people. And that is the hope that things will just go back to normal when this is over. But of course, normal means different things for different people. And yet, if Jesus' resurrection has shown us anything, it is that for his people, everything has already been reset to its true normal. See, resurrection has always been the reality that God intended to be the normal, normal Christian life. Hopefully, sooner rather than later, this virus, this virus will die out, or a vaccine will be developed to control it. That will happen. And when it does, the lived reality of the world will change as a result. Some will try to reconstruct the old normal, and some will try to reconstruct a new normal. But here's the thing for us in Christ. Nothing has changed our true normal since the moment Jesus walked out of that tomb the first Easter morning. Easter was not about recreating the first seven days of creation. Easter was the first day of the new creation. The eighth day is what early Christians called it. The eighth day. The first day of the brand new creation. And you know, they changed the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday to reflect that changed reality. Jesus wasn't raised to new life so he could go back to living an old life. The risen Christ did not invite his first disciples to follow him backward, but forward into the new creation which had come into the world and would continue to spread like yeast through dough until the whole earth is covered in the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. See, this is a reason that the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' resurrection insist he was not only spiritually real, but was physically real as well, like Tony was saying earlier. His body matters because bodies matter to God. But his physicality, the physicality of his resurrection matters. In the whole big scheme of things, the whole plan and the whole unfolding of resurrection and the new creation. First John 1 says this, from the very first day we were there. These are, this is obviously written by early disciples who were eyewitnesses to the resurrection. From the very first day we were there taking it all in. We heard it with our own ears, saw it with our own eyes, verified it with our own hands. This is real. They're saying objectively verifiable. The word of life appeared right before our eyes. We saw it happen and now we're telling you in the most sober prose that what we witnessed was incredibly this, the infinite life of God himself took shape before us. We saw it, we heard it, and now we're telling you, so you can experience it along with us, this experience of communion with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. See, these first witnesses to Jesus' resurrection are adamant. This is not a fantasy we imagined in our grief. This is not a story we made up. This really happened. And because it really happened, reality as we know it has been completely changed. Yes, they're saying there is a reality beyond our physical senses that is as real or maybe even more real than anything we've ever known before. In this transformed reality, the dead do live again. The powers that held us captive are destroyed and the impossible can happen at any time. And we can know this with confidence through both our physical senses and our newly given spiritual senses, which forever alter our limited human understandings of everything, especially each other. Mm -hmm. As Tony was just saying, Paul encourages us. He's, he's saying, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. We looked at the Messiah that way once, and we got it all wrong, as you know. We certainly don't look at him that way anymore. Now we look inside, 
And what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start, is created new. The old life is gone and new life virgins. Look at it. Look it's at like it. God saying in the very beginning, behold, behold this glorious creation I am remaking new. Jesus' resurrection has utterly changed reality. And our experience of reality can change too, as we do what Paul says. Behold it, look at it. See the unchanging resurrection reality that is present in the midst of every changing circumstance of our lives. Wow, isn't this good stuff? Yeah, it's <laughs> a lot of stuff. Through. We're going to pull this to a close. Now, you may have noticed we used a lot of scripture in this <laughs> message. <laughs> but that's because what we're talking about is what I said at the beginning. This is the core to our faith. And some of what we're saying here is still controversial in some circles. And we want you to be assured we're not making this up. This yep. is what Jesus and the apostles said. This is what the early church believed. This is what's been true all along. His resurrection changes everything, including us. Yes. So what do we do with this? Well, we can pile away good, interesting information in our heads, and that would be the mistake that you could walk away from this message with. Now, there's a better response. <laughs> our response of loving faith is to be God's partner. Yes. See, we said before, there's a temptation regards Jesus' resurrection as the end rather than the beginning. But Paul told the Corinthians that Christ was the first fruits of yep. the resurrection. We follow after. What happened to him is what happened to us if we choose yes and so the invitation today is to choose to respond in loving surrender to what god has already done for you in love with love for love and allow these changes to be true in you yes so today we've given you this encouraging foundation of truth mm -hmm. in the coming weeks we'll talk about how this happens in very practical terms how Jesus honored his friends. We haven't laid aside our annual theme for all this. In fact, it's been underneath the surface, even though we haven't talked as much about it. Yeah. How Jesus came alongside his friends in his weeks after the resurrection to do a number of things, to console them, to clarify them, to commission them, to challenge them, to commune with them. So that when his spirit came on Pentecost, they were ready to be changed and ready to become world changers. And everything he did for them is what he does for us we too can be changed. Yes. Oh, and so as we begin to, um, just as we draw this message to a close um, and look forward, I'm looking forward to all of those messages that begin with C um, in the coming weeks. Um, just going to invite you to, I'm going to pray a closing prayer and I'm going to invite you, you know, wherever you are. Um, you may be listening to this in your car. If so, keep your eyes open. <laughs> or you may be um, listening to this at a table or wherever you are. I just invite you to, the words are on the screen, I think, Tony, we have PowerPoint. Um, feel free to pray this prayer out loud with me as your own declaration of the way that the resurrection has changed you already and your prayer that it would continue to change you more and more into the likeness and image of Christ. This prayer is called Free Indeed. You did a marvel, Lord Jesus Christ, and make me feel beside myself in surprise. My spirit glistens with your rising. I smile and smile with you. I am drowning in the laughter of your friends. You have won, Lord. We know you have won. You have defeated all the worst that we could do, each alone and all together. You crushed the power of darkness and of death to walk peacefully again in our flesh now and forever. Come to me, great Lord of life, as you come to all your friends. Send me to console those around me who hurt. Come and send your friends into this daily word world to labor full of hope for the reign of God. 
Heavenly Father and God of mercy, I no longer look for Jesus among the dead, for he is alive and has become the Lord of life. From the tomb of death, you raise me with him and renew your gift of life within me. Increase in my mind and in my heart the risen life I share with Jesus and help me to grow as your servant from this day into eternity. Amen and amen. And never forget that the resurrection changes everything. Amen. Blessings, Susanna. <laughs>